Listen, that was pretty good. That's like Yeshua Rose. That's pretty neat. How about you make a shout like your king is alive? How about that? <laughs> Hallelujah. That's a little bit better. That's a little bit better. Praise the Lord. We'll get to shout a little bit more tonight, too. Praise the Lord. You know, I, I just got back from a, a couple of weeks tour in Europe, and I, you have to be sensitive to the space and what country you're in. I was in Germany, and then in Switzerland, and then Finland, uh, and Denmark, and in, in, in the Netherlands, and Belgium, and each spot is a little bit different of how they worship the Lord. But you need to get a taste of Jerusalem. That's we're, we're a little bit excited about the Lord here. Listen, come on. Let's go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, there's, there's celebrations going on around the world, and they're shouting to the Lord, but man, I would love to have heaven's head and ear turn to us in Jerusalem and say, that was great what's happening over there, but listen to what's happening in Jerusalem. You want to try one more time? <laughs> Hallelujah. That's good. Getting better every time. Hallelujah. See, we got to let Brazil <laughs> rub off on Finland every once in a while. Right. We're so happy you're here. Welcome home, King of Kings family and our members. We're uh, so happy to celebrate this day with you. Welcome all of our visitors from around the world as well. Those of you watching online, Kings Community Live, Facebook, YouTube, and all of our platforms, welcome to Jerusalem on this uh, God-appointed holiday. It's a good day to be in the presence of the Lord because on this day, he promised a date night with us. This was his appointed time. He's the one that asked us to come be with me tonight. So you can guarantee out of all of the days of the year when he's invited you to come, that's an important day to be in his presence together with the people of Israel. And how much more special to do that here in Jerusalem, just a few minutes walk from the Temple Mount. Isn't that exciting? That's very exciting. So happy you're here with us tonight. Some people I do want to honor because I mentioned Finland, I do want to honor all of Ula's sisters. Thank you guys for being here today. Bless you. Did anybody enjoy the Jesus Revolution film last week? Well, listen, it was wonderful to have a time of, before we showed the film, we had a few moments of uh, like an interview with the producer, Andy Irwin was here on stage with us, but the person who made it happen, that put it all together, that introduced the ideas here tonight, Richard, thank you, friend, for putting it all together tonight. Thank you so much. And then a wonderful Passover uh, Seder meal with all of you and those of you watching online that joined us. That was wonderful. Uh, great night. And all of you that served, thank you so much. Um, and I just want to mention Mikael's name. And the reason I want to mention Mikael's name is because when I, a couple of people know who I'm talking about, is because at the end of the night when we tried to thank everybody who was involved, I left two people out on accident and Mikael came up to me and, and told me, hey, you, you left Noam's name out. So I, of course, went to Noam after, and I said, man, we left your name out. That is my fault. Forgive me. And he said, hey, don't worry about it. It was a pleasure to serve. But what Mikael forgot to tell me was that he was the other one whose name got left out. <laughs> so Mikael, thank you, friend, for all of your help for the Passover Seder. <laughs> Thought you were going to get away with it. No, on the bigger stage, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. We also have visitors tonight. I just want to uh, say a welcome to Pastor Lenny Chang from Trumpeter Ministries in New York. Thank you, Pastor, for being here tonight and all of your team. It's a great night. Listen, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam shechianu v'kiyamanu v'higianu lazman hazeh. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who is brought us to the season. He sustained us and given us life. We made it to this season one more time. 
And because we are commanded from the Sabbath after the Passover to count 50 days in anticipation to Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, the giving of the Torah, the giving of the Spirit, we say, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam, asher kedshanu b'chazdo v'tzivano al sefirat ha'omer hayom yom rvi'i. Today is the fourth day of the counting of the Omer, right? So we're going to count 50 days. You'll be seeing us do that every week in our service in obedience to the Lord's commandments. I want to start tonight's word with some confessions of faith. Can we do that? We're going to start, if you don't know much about King of Kings, we do welcome you, but the members, you already know about this, but I want to start with some confessions of faith. We believe that Yeshua died for our sins on Passover as the Passover lamb. Dirk did a great job of reading the Parshat Shavuot today. Thank you, Dirk. And he even mentioned John 1.29. The next day, John saw Yeshua coming toward him and said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John had that revelation at the very beginning of Yeshua's earthly ministry. That means John was flowing under the wisdom and insight Revelation of the Holy Spirit already. He was getting that ahead of everyone else. We believe that Yeshua's blood is applied to the hearts of those that put their faith in his sacrificial work and that this blood cleanses us from all sins. Going back to a different John here. 1 John chapter nine, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's a confession that we have. We believe that Yeshua was in the grave during the feast of Chag HaMatzah, the feast of unleavened bread. He was taking away the sin of the world. He was removing the yeast, the leaven from our heart during the feast of unleavened bread. We believe that. Ephesians 4 verse 9 says, What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? Another reference is made by the apostle Peter in reference to Yeshua going to the lower depths, taking back the keys of hell and death and rising again with new life and giving us the keys. 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 through 20. For Messiah also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. We believe that Yeshua, having done his sacrificial work on the cross, And having done his cleansing work in the grave, then resurrected from the dead on the God-commanded feast day of Yom HaBikorim, the first fruits, which is today. We believe that. It coincided with God's appointed times. We believe that the giving of the Holy Spirit and the law coincided with God's appointed times. We believe that the last trumpet that will sound upon his return is also somehow connecting us to the Feast of Trumpets. We believe that the great white throne judgment corresponds somehow with the Day of Atonement. And we believe that when this age is over and God dwells again with mankind in that Sukkot age, we believe that that is a connecting symbol of the Feast of Tabernacles. God is doing great things on his days Someone asked me one time, why do you put so much emphasis on God's appointed holidays? There are other important times during the year. I agree, there are other important times. But these seven festivals were laid out for us to learn more about Yeshua, learn more about his earthly work, learn more about the work he's going to do, and they tell us where we lie on the prophetic calendar of God's eternal timeline. So if we're people that pay attention, then you should pay attention to God's appointed festivals. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who fall asleep. You see, the apostle Paul got that kind of revelation by the Holy Spirit ahead of everyone else. 
He understood that this day was connected to, not only long ago, but it was connected to the physical resurrection of Yeshua. It's like the Lord is giving us a hint. It's like he's laying out the crumbs for us to follow and walk to the miracles. And I'm so grateful that I don't have to guess. There's enough uncertainty in this world. I don't want to have to guess what God is doing. I want to know what God is doing so that I can be part of it. I want you to know what God is doing so that you can be part of it as well. Now, with this background understanding of the confessions that we've made so far, we are then told that the resurrection itself is a pillar statement in our confession of faith for salvation. What I mean is this, from Romans, you cannot even be saved unless you believe in the resurrection. That's how important this confession is. I want to give you our main text tonight from Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 8 and 9. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You cannot be saved without those things. Why? Because true faith demands action. Right? It's not enough to just think it. You can't just, I think Yeshua's Lord. I don't need to tell anybody else I think that. I, I can just think it. The Bible says, no, faith demands an action. If you really believe it, then you will move upon that faith. And sometimes you have to do something that's out of your comfort zone. You have to do something that puts you out in public square in the dangerous zone of the Romans whose emperor doesn't like your movement and to say in front of everyone that while I do honor the emperor and the king, Yeshua is my Lord. Because faith has an action to it. But why did the resurrection of Yeshua become so important that it is one of the two elements in which we must believe in order to be saved? How come we couldn't just believe in his death and his sacrifice and his blood atonement and his, his acts of loving kindness and his miracles? How come we couldn't just believe in his words and his teachings and his prophecies? How come that wasn't enough? How come the resurrection has to be part of the salvation profession of faith? We're going to answer that question. In this short two verses, we learn at least three things that we are agreeing to. Number one, because it talks about being saved at all, we are saying that we believe Yeshua is the Messiah and Savior. That's the context of the whole confession. We can't make the confession if we don't first believe that he's the Messiah. So by saying it with our mouth, believing it in our heart, we are first saying that we believe Yeshua is Messiah and Savior. He is the one being discussed in this passage. So if someone can confess this statement, then they are saying that they believe that Yeshua is the Messiah who brought salvation from sin. This statement is also clear that we believe Yeshua died for our sins because we cannot believe in the resurrection unless we first believe in the sacrificial death. So therefore, if you make this confession, you are saying, I believe Yeshua is the Messiah and he saved me from my sins and he died for my sins. That's what you're saying if you make this confession of faith. Secondly, you are saying that Yeshua is the Lord of your life. Meaning that we as believers willingly lay down our life, we lay down our ways, and we submit joyfully to the lordship of the Messiah. It's a willing and joyful submission to the ways of the Lord. It's not supposed to be a wrestling match. God is not supposed to have to try to convince you to lay down the things you used to do and the ways you used to think. He's not, he's not supposed to try, to try to catch you and put you in a corner after all of the logic 
and say, ha, I trapped you here and I trapped you there and now you have nowhere to go, so you have to believe. This is an opportunity where we get the chance to willingly and joyfully lay down our ways to pick up his ways and we confess with our mouth that Yeshua is Lord. So we've confessed that he's Messiah and Savior. We've confessed that we believe he died for our sins. We've confessed that he is Lord and we submit to his kingship. You see, that's what Rome didn't like. They didn't mind the whole death for salvation and sin stuff. That didn't bother them. It was the submission to his rule that Rome didn't like. And then third, we are confessing in this statement that Yeshua is the risen king. Having conquered sin through his own death, he has now conquered death and judgment by his resurrection. It's, we're not only saying that he rose from the dead. We are saying that, but that's not all we're saying. We're saying that we believe that, but in that resurrection that he defeated death itself. So that the next time Satan tries to threaten you or intimidate you with the idea that you should be scared of death, remember that Yeshua already won that battle and there's nothing for you to be afraid of. Therefore, there's no weapon the enemy can form against you. You've confessed that. Not only did he die for your sins and he rose from the dead, but he conquered sin and death so that you would never have to worry about it again. That's a lot of stuff packed into this little statement of faith. So when you say it, I want you to be able to say it now with a new depth of meaning, with a new level of revelation. Now, ultimately, we learn a lot about this confession, and I'm sure there's much more the Holy Spirit can give us. And if there is a doubt in Yeshua's deity, in his leadership, in his sacrificial death, in his resurrection, if there's any doubt that he conquered sin, we would not be able to make this statement. It would be a false statement from our point of view if we doubted. But it's also a way by making this, uh, this profession from Romans, it's also a way of us saying that Yeshua did the impossible. That's what you're saying. You're saying he did the impossible. Now, that is true, right? And I realize that as we share the love of Messiah, the reality of God's kingdom to those around us who don't know him yet, I realize that that can be a barrier to some people, that you're acting as if he did something that is impossible. I heard it recently. I heard it. It was here in the sanctuary. We had got done with the service. There were a few Orthodox Jewish brothers. I was a rabbi and some of his students that were with us that night, which we always welcome to come in and worship with us. They had come in, and after the service, they wanted to ask me a few questions, so I went in the back. They asked me a few questions, and when I began to talk about Yeshua the Messiah being God himself in the flesh, being the perfect sacrifice for our Passover needs, the rabbi turned to his students and said, see, they believe in the impossible. <laughs> and I said to the students, that's right, we do. Why would you want to serve a God who can't do the impossible? Why would I want to serve a God whose skill level is at the same level as other people? Wouldn't that make us the same as God? Wouldn't that make us the Savior? But clearly, we're not. We've gotten ourselves into a mess. Let me tell you how wonderful it is to serve a God who can do the impossible. A God who can give you free will to choose him, never violate that free will, and love you enough to still choose him. A God who will never make you not sin, but he'll love you enough so you don't want to anymore. That's how a love relationship is supposed to work anyway. A God that can do that. That's the kind of God I want to serve anyway. 
After all, doesn't it sound impossible for one person to take away the sin of the whole world? And not just the sin of that moment, by the way, not just the sin of that generation, the sin of everyone who's ever come before and everyone who will come after. How in the world do you, I, listen, my brain, I'm a simple guy. I heard too many amens on that one, but <laughs> I, I'm not gonna say where they came from. I, I feel like that direction needs prayer. Hallelujah. Love your pastor. I'm a simple guy. I can understand, like I can get it. I can process how you forgave someone who did something in the past. But God is so good, he can forgive that which hasn't happened yet. Now that's doing the impossible. That's amazing. That's where our, our hope and salvation rests in his ability to do that. It doesn't rest in our ability to be perfect. It rests in his ability to do the impossible. Isn't that what John said? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world? For God so loved the whole world that he gave, right? That's an impossible sounding thing, but he does it. Doesn't it sound impossible that the almighty God, the, the formless God who is a spirit who apparently is larger than the universe that he created himself somehow decided to put himself into a tiny little human flesh that he might die for us, a life for life. It, it, I get it. It sounds impossible that he could do it, but that's worth serving, the fact that he could do that. He can make the impossible possible. And why would you want to serve someone who couldn't? Keep that thread going in your mind. Listen to Philippians 2 verse five through eight. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Yeshua, the Messiah, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Yes, that sounds impossible, but he did it. And the eyewitnesses saw it. We're not making up literature here. This is not a fictional tale. Eyewitnesses saw it. Let me give you our first key phrase of the night. There are so many impossibilities in the story of Yeshua that it would take us believing in the impossible for us to receive him. So in light of that, I'm encouraging all of us, you better start believing in the impossible. If you don't start believing in the impossible, you're gonna get left behind in the age that we're entering right now. For those of you that may not have heard, a few days ago, there was a, there was a skirmish on the Temple Mount. There were some young Muslim, uh, young Muslim men who didn't want to leave the Temple Mount. Some of the Israeli soldiers had to come in. They were forced to deal with the Arab young men who had barricaded themselves to the temple. They wouldn't leave. And when the Israeli soldiers engaged with them, there's video showing of how violent it got. Well, that video footage, of course, immediately goes out to the world. And since that point, we have started to experience some devastating things here in the land. We've already seen two terror attacks inside our country, one with a car ramming into people and killing several, and others a shooting that killed several. In both cases, the families were just going on their way to vacation because it's a vacation week here in Israel. And then that started a chain of retaliation in which we started to see rockets fire from Lebanon. Of course, Hamas claimed to be part of that. And then we saw it from Syria. And then we had violence in the West Bank areas and then rockets from Gaza. And now there's rockets from all sides. I got a call last night 
from a pastor in Pennsylvania, USA, bringing a group over in just a few weeks. Pastor Chad, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about what's happening. I'm watching the news. You guys are having terror from the inside and rockets from all sides coming from the outside. I'm concerned to bring my group. What should I do? I said, Pastor, you better start believing in the impossible. Because we don't get to live here if we don't believe in the impossible. How thousands of rockets over the last couple of years, over 2,000 in the last two years, fired upon Israel, and how so few even land. And the ones that do land generally just land in the dirt. Now, there are a few casualties, and we do pray for them, their families. But God is doing some amazing things. If God can preserve the Jewish people as the only true remaining ancient people group because of a promise he made, he can do the impossible. And that's what we want to focus on on this holiday. We are expected now, friends, to believe in the impossible. We've seen miracles happen over the last few weeks. We've seen people come through miraculous surgeries where they went back to their doctor and the doctor said to them, we got to change your treatment. Something changed in your body. And we're holding on to that miracle. We believe in the impossible. We believe that last week when we got a report that up in our summit prayer tower that there was gold dust in the room and got video of it. Then we went up there as a staff on Tuesday to see if it was still there. And guess what? Still there. I can't promise you it's always going to be there, but I was an eyewitness when people were doing their fingers, looking around. Hey, look, gold from heaven. That's just a little plug that after service tonight, I cannot promise you gold dust, but I can tell you where it was, and the summit is open 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock tonight after service. That is a true statement. It's called afterglow. Did I say after gold? No, I said afterglow. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Remember, believing in the resurrection is part of the believer's confession of faith. Being raised from the dead also sounds impossible. Acts chapter 2, 24, but God raised Yeshua from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Even God says, hey, you better start believing in the impossible because that's the business that I'm in. It was impossible for death to do it because God can do the impossible. And Yeshua begins to make the point very clear to us over and over in a pattern that you must believe in the impossible to be saved. Let me give you our final verse for the night. Mark chapter 10, 23 to 27. Yeshua looked around and said to the disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Yeshua said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for anyone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? We're gonna go back to the confession. Who can be saved? Yeshua looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Death on the cross, shed blood that was perfect and pure, taking away the sin of the whole world, past, present, and future while he was in the grave, rising from the dead, having defeated hell and death, taking back the keys that had once been lost. All of that. God coming down into human flesh. God giving you a future and a hope and a calling and a destiny despite your own weaknesses. All of this sounds impossible 
But that's exactly what God is asking you to believe in to be saved. You must believe in the impossible today. What we have to wrestle with is this. Do we really think that Yeshua, as God himself, is able to do these things? Did he really create all things by his words? That sounds impossible. Did he really, really visit mankind several times as the angel of the Lord throughout Scripture? Was his presence really permanently standing on top of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies? Is that a true story? Is that real? It sounds impossible. But he's asking you to believe it. Did Yeshua really do all of the miracles that the eyewitnesses said that he did, including raising others from the dead? That sounds impossible. We'll close with this key phrase tonight, our second one. We are being asked to believe that Yeshua did the impossible in the past so that we can believe he can and will do the impossible for us again in the future. It doesn't do you much good to pray for all of the miracles that are coming if you can't believe in the miracles that were already. You, it's kind of hypocritical to get on your knees and say, God, I need you to break through in the impossible now, but I don't believe you did it before. No, God is saying, if you want the impossible now, you better embrace that I've already done it. And when opposition comes to the gospel, and people might say to you, I cannot believe in this foolishness. Just remember the foolishness of God dumbfounds the wise of the world. It will take you believing in the impossible. And this, my friends, is the confession of Romans 10. This is all of the things that are included in that two little verses that you're supposed to carry with you. It puts us in a position not only believing in what he has done, but in believing and what he says he will do in the future. Let's bring some application to this. What impossible thing do you need now? Because if I'm just playing the odds with how full this room is and everybody watching online tonight, that there are several people here, they need God to do something impossible for them. Some of you, it may be a physical healing. It may be a broken marriage. It may be calling out for a spouse, waiting a long time for a promise to come to fruition. It may be a job that you need a breakthrough, and maybe it's a financial breakthrough that you need. Maybe it's a pattern of sin that you're caught up in and you can't get out. You need the impossible breakthrough today. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to stand as an act of your faith. Stand, and I'm going to pray over you. If anyone in the audience tonight just needs a miracle, you just need the impossible, stand to your feet. We're going to pray together. If you're not standing, I'm going to ask you to intercede with me. If you pray in your heavenly prayer language, if you pray in tongues, this is a great moment to pray it privately, but corporately all at the same time. I'm going to ask you to lift your voices to the Lord as we pray. Heavenly Father, we need miracles. We cannot make it anymore in this age of darkness without miracles, without the supernatural move of the Holy Spirit. We're asking you to touch lives today in the name of Yeshua. Father, for the people sick, I'm asking you to bring healing today. I'm asking you to fill them with holy oil that they can feel the warmth of your touch on their body. Let them feel the hot oil pouring over their head right now in the name of Yeshua. Let there be testimonies and confessions of miracles and healings. Father, we pray for marriages. We pray for humility to break through in the marriage. Confession of sin, we call it forth. We pray for courage to get on a humble knee and to say, I'm sorry. I've broken our covenant. Father, we pray for a breakthrough of sin tonight, that you would break us out of the shackles that have held us for far too long in the schemes of the evil one. God, we need miracles. We need the impossible today. Father, we pray for a breakthrough of jobs. 
We pray for a breakthrough of those things we've held on to for a long time, and we're getting tired of holding on to those promises. God, we need perseverance tonight in the name of Yeshua. Breakthrough in the financial department. Breakthrough in the safety department. Breakthrough for, the, for those that have prayed for children. We pray for pregnancies, God. Supernaturally given tonight. In the name of Yeshua. This is a day of the impossible. Would you do it for us, God? Do it on this appointed holiday. In Yeshua's name we pray. Hallelujah, amen. Somebody give a shout to the Lord.